It's the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa Podcast. As we now have put the final four into the books, we now have everything set for next weekend in Arizona. Two favorites, two surprises as Purdue in what was a really tough, rugged, and good game uh, outlasted Tennessee behind 40 points and 16 rebounds for Edie, although he did struggle on the foul line late. Uh, Connect was terrific, scoring 37 in what was a shootout between the two players uh, for Tennessee. And NC State, which uh, got behind, was behind at the half against Duke, and then played a really smart, tough second half, and Duke really just unraveled uh, in a big way. Really came apart at the seams. And NC State beat them again uh, to become, for at least for this time, the kings of Tobacco Road. Uh, down there in the Research Triangle where they love their basketball. And everything is Duke. Everything is Carolina. Now it's everything is NC State for the first time since the days of Jim Balvano in the early 80s uh, when they shocked the world uh, and shocked Phi Slamma Jamma in the 83 tournament to win a national uh, championship. Um, like I said, two favorites, UConn, which was dominant against Illinois, uh, and, and has been dominant against everybody, and is a heavy favorite, and has been installed as a uh, twelve point. It opened at eleven and a half. It's already gone to twelve. I wouldn't be surprised if it went to fourteen uh, or fifteen by the time they play the game next Saturday. Because really, um, how do you bet against UConn? I mean, you'd have to be crazy to with what you've seen, uh, not just during this tournament, but all season. They have been. They have been that good. They have been uh, that special. They really have in every way uh, and deserve to be considered the favorites that they are. They've been installed right now as uh, 12-point favorites against uh, Alabama, the four seed out of the West, who surprised you know, and shot their way with a really good performance from three, shot their way uh, into the Final Four. And Purdue has been established as a a nine-and-a-half-point favorite against Cinderella, if you want to call them such, although they are from the ACC, um, NC State. I thought NC State would fall to Duke. I was very wrong about the way that game unfolded. I thought Duke would have a good game from three. They had a miserable game from three. Uh, They let UConn, I mean, they let NC State completely dictate terms in the second half, play a two-man basketball game on offense, play the right tempo they wanted, play the game exactly how they wanted to play it. And like I said, Duke, which had a seven-point lead and had chances early. Now, they had a seven-point lead without shooting the ball well from three. If they came out in in the second half and shot the ball well from three, they could have broken the game open. Instead, NC State chipped away, chipped away, and then completely took over the game. And at 48-40, when Duke called timeout, I knew the game was over because Duke had unraveled. They had let the game get completely away, uh, completely away from them. Uh, Now, if you go back to before the tournament started, I picked UConn to win it all. I stand by that completely. I picked uh, Purdue and a UConn-Purdue final saying I hoped we got the battle of the big men on Monday night. I picked Houston, and I picked Alabama. So I hit three out of four. Houston, I was unlucky. I could have gotten the fourth one in there. That I think they would have won if they were healthy, but they weren't, so that's the end of that. NC State's there. They earned their way there. Uh, they had some ups and downs. They had their moments, but they've overall surprised some good teams in beating Marquette and then beating Duke to get here. Now... UConn is a heavy favorite. Purdue is a heavy favorite. They both deserve to be heavy favorites. And you know what? I expect both of them to win comfortably. And we will have the showdown that we want on Monday night. Edie, the player of the year, coming off a 40 and 16, a dominant offensive force against Klingon and the big multi-talented center 
for UConn. UConn's got the better supporting cast. There's no question about that. They will be favored on Monday night. They deserve that. But the scenario that you're wondering is if if Edie can get Klingon and the UConn Huskies in foul trouble, can he pull off the finishing touch on what has been a terrific season? His biggest game ever in the regional final, getting Purdue to the final four with a 40.16 rebound performance. He made a great, after he missed two free throws and looked tired, he came down and blocked Connect shot with a five-point lead, which turned out to be uh, the biggest play of the game, and they went on to a six-point uh, victory. Uh, like I said, I told you uh, when we reached the, uh, the weekend, the Elite Eight, I told you that I thought the favorites would win all four games. They won three out of four. They didn't win the fourth one. They didn't win the Duke game. Uh, NC State won it and won it, and won it going away. I was very wrong about how that game unfolded. Uh, overall, did a good job in this round picking uh, the games uh, of the last 12 games. I was 9-3, which is pretty good. I'll take that any time. But I was wrong about Duke in a big way. Now, I think we will get what we want, what I've wanted from moment one. What a lot of people thought could be the finishing touch on this season, UConn and their big center against the player of the year and Purdue. And I think hopefully we get that because that's the only thing that stands even reasonably in front of UConn. Listen, I picked Alabama to get to the Final Four. It was a good pick. They did some amazing things from three in the second half of the game that propelled them uh, into the Final Four. Sears was terrific in the second half after having a cold first half. He is a dynamic, dynamic three-point shooter. They made a ton of threes, 16 threes in the game, which is a lot. When you see how much these teams struggle, Purdue struggles from three today. Um, Duke struggled from three today. Alabama was great from three, and they would have to make 20 threes to beat UConn. They deserve to be a double-digit underdog. And I think the number nine and a half is a good number for the NC State game because I think NC State's going to have a lot of trouble handling Edie and Purdue. And like I said, I think we will get UConn and Purdue, and I hope we do because, like I said, I don't think Alabama's got much of a chance against UConn. I don't think anybody does except the idea that you have Edie in his final game have an enormous game and put the mighty Huskies into trouble. Now, he's not going to do it with shot blocking. He's not a great defensive player, but he can foul out and draw an enormous amount of fouls, which he did against Tennessee. Now, in that game, he was only 14 and 22 from the foul line, which isn't good enough. And he missed some really big ones down the stretch, which could have cost them dearly. Maybe he's a little tired, but he's got to do better than that down the stretch. I don't want to knock a guy who had 40 points and 16 rebounds, but he didn't make a lot of free throws down the stretch, and that could be critical. But they're the only ones that have even a puncher's chance against Mighty Yukon. So there we go. Final four. UConn's still there. Purdue is there. Houston had a tough injury to their All-America point guard. NC State shocked everybody by getting here. Most people didn't even have them in the tournament. Nobody had them in the tournament a week before the ACC uh, tournament. They weren't going anywhere. The coach wasn't even going to have a, new, have a job. Now they're in the Final Four and Alabama. And what was, I thought, a very suspect West Regional because I thought the West with Carolina, Vela, and Arizona had weak-seeded teams, which is why I took Alabama. Um, now let's get to baseball. Let me start with the positive. Right now, I know if you're a Yankee fan, basically you are giddy. You're past giddy. You're probably close to unconscious right now after four straight wins, dramatic wins, all with a different story against 
Houston, what could be a better way to start a season after the long, tough season you endured last year and the off season that was frustrating at times. And then March with the injuries, especially to Wonder Cole. And here you are opening with a tough schedule through four in Houston, three in Arizona, and go there and win all four. Right now, if you're the Yankees, on the way to Arizona, they should stop off and buy some lottery tickets because everything went right in this series. Game one, Holmes, who, like I said, I don't trust as a closer, came in, game one, gave three, uh, gave in th- up three straight hits, and got Soto, which is not his strength, to throw a guy out at the plate to preserve the victory. And then today, they saved the best for last. Okay? They saved the best for last today in what was not just a dramatic win, but everything you could have possibly hoped for in the Yankee series against Houston and to see this stuff early in the year, to see Hader on the mound, who was a premier relief pitcher, as good as it gets, and to have Soto, who has gotten off to a brilliant start at the plate, and have him fight off a breaking ball, take a pitch that was just inches inside, and then take an outside fastball, lace it to left field for the go-ahead run, and then get ready for the bottom of the ninth with a 4-3 lead after he had relinquished the lead in the sixth inning. Not that Schmidt pitched badly. He didn't. You know, that's not bad. He's, he pitched okay. Something to, to, to bank on. I understand he, he, you know, he had a 3-1 lead and it became 3-3. So, hey, he didn't pitch badly, though. The bullpen leading up to Holmes was good all four games. Now, you get to the bottom of the ninth. Houston's lost three in a row. You got 8-9 up before you get to Altuve and you're thinking the guy gets on and you got to face Alvarez, who's gotten off to a slow start in this series. Base hit by Pena. Base hit by the pinch hit of Caratini. Now it's first and second, and here is the nemesis of nemesis, Altuve. I don't expect Altuve to bunt there. I I never thought he would bunt there because, first of all, if he bunts there, Joe Jordan made a great point. Hey, Houston's not looking for extra innings. Their bullpen's, you know, on fumes in this early season. They want to end it here. Number two, you bun him, they're going to walk Alvarez, and they'll look for Holmes to see if he can get a double play ball at at, at a Tucker. So you're not taking a bat out of Alvarez's hands. So Altuve is up. He takes a couple of fastballs. He takes a 1-0 fastball for a strike. He takes a 1-1 fastball for a strike. He's in the hole 1-2. He laces a ball that should have been a game-tying and maybe game-winner down the left field line, and instead, instead, Birdie makes an incredible play. Not a good play, a great play. Backhands the hard-hit ground ball that is headed down the left field line for extra bases, gets the force, doesn't force a throw, which he would not have gotten Altuve at first anyway. Holds the ball, and now you got an out. So instead of having the game tied and second and third, or the game over if the ball gets bobbled in the left field corner, you have first and second, one out. And here's, here is the very dangerous but slumping Alvarez. He hits the ball down the left field line. Again, this looks like it's a game-tying double, maybe game-winning double down the left field line, and it lands maybe eight inches foul. Again, inches from the game being a disaster for the Yankees. 
Alvarez is still up. Remember, he's done nothing. He gets most, not all, of a ball to just to the left of center field. Backs Judge to the track. Judge catches it. Now it's first and third, two outs. So you've survived the ball that El Tuve hit, which had double written all over it. You survived the ball that Alvarez hit that had double written all over it. That's inches foul. You survive the ball that Alvarez, who banged his bat and his helmet in the dugout in disgust because he thought he had a pitch that he could hit at a ballpark and drove it to the track just to the left of dead center field. So Holmes is fooling nobody. He's given up a single. He's given up another single. He's given up a ball that should have been a double. He's given up another ball that should have been a double and another ball that should have been a homer. And here comes the very dangerous Tucker. What does he do? He rips a line at a left field, and Verdugo makes, goes down and makes a sweet catch, and the Yankees have their four-game sweep. Holmes... Holmes gets, he gets two of his three saves on games he probably should have lost. Two should have, instead of him having three saves out of three save opportunities, he should have two blown save opportunities. Instead, he's got three saves, and the Yankees have four wins. They came from behind. They won close games. And they opened the season 4-0, and which they haven't done in a very long time. Soto has been stupendous. They've gotten, you know, Cabrera has gotten off. He didn't have a hit today, but he's gotten off to a very, very fast start in trying to keep, you know, his bat in the lineup. A lot of the other guys, like, Torres and Judge and uh, even even Verdugo haven't really hit yet, but they've contributed where they needed to contribute, whether it's sacrifice flies, plays in the outfield, Judge with a sack fly, Verdugo the other day with a sack fly, uh, plays here and there. The bottom line is the Yankees now head to Arizona with four wins in the bank. They probably didn't need a plane. And for Yankee fans who lived through last year's awful season, where they were inept in every way, where they were just embarrassing offensively, where they could do little right, and now here they are in this early season, you know, wiping away, wiping away that 82 and 80 season. That left them 19 games behind Baltimore in an embarrassing display. I mean, they were six games out of the wild card, which should never happen to the Yankees in this new wild card setup. 82 and 80, just staying on the north side of 500. And probably putting forth one of the most anemic performances that they have offensively in, in their history. That's how bad it was. And instead, Soto has l- not only been a presence, he has led them. He has done everything right. He has not fit in. He has just thrived. I can't think of a guy who has come to a team with this kind of reputation or come to our city with this kind of reputation and not had a period where he tries to prove his worth and tries to prove his rep and tries to prove his money and tries to prove everything. He's come here and hit the ground 
just magnificently in every way. He has come here and said, hey, this is going to be different. Hello, New York. When he comes home for the home opener, and this week the weather looks just, I mean, the Yanks are lucky they're away for a couple more days because the weather this week is going to be cold and dreary and wet. I mean, the week is just awful. As early April can be in New York, this is as bad as he can get what we're going to see this week. But they're going to be in Arizona for three games, trying to build on what is already a 4-0 and start. In this season that, hey, does it mean that all their issues are answered? Of course not. Does it mean that they aren't going to have issues during the season? No. But you know what? It's a lot different than it's been. Yeah, I know you can tell me, you know, Milwaukee's 3-0 and after sweeping the Mets, or the Pirates are 4-0. and That's fine. Or the Tigers are 3-0. and But they played the White Sox, who were pitiful. And, Cle- and Cleveland's 3-0. and But they played Oakland, where, or 3-1, and everybody's going to beat Oakland. But the Yankees are 4-0. and 4-0. and And that's been a long time coming, and they did it on the road in Houston. So for Yankee fans, it is a giddy, giddy time. They can't almost hide the glee. And they are being led in every way by Soto. Now, as good (laughs) as it has been for the Yankees, that is how bad it has been for the Mets. As I said to you, The one thing you don't want to do in any season, doesn't matter what sport you're talking about, doesn't matter what level you're talking about, you don't want to go into a drought to open the season. You want to get your first hit, your first home run, your first win, your first save, Okay, you want to do whatever as a team you want to get your first win. Now, the Mets have historically gotten their first win on opening day. They have been far and away the darlings of opening day. That changed this year against the Milwaukee team that always gives them fit. We know that. To get one hit on opening day. Now, we know that the Mets were trying to sell you, hey, Things are not as bad as everyone thought they were. You know, we can make the playoffs. We're going to surprise. There's a great feeling here. There's a great chemistry here. There's a new manager here. Well, instead, they're three games in. They botched sending a message when they had a perfect chance in the first inning of game two to Hoskins. They had a perfect chance to send a message. They botched that. And he beats them up. Then their manager winds up getting suspended anyway. They can't do anything right. Now, don't fall into this stupid trap of worrying about whether Pete Alonzo is up singing with some singer at the UBS Center, okay, two games into the season. Nobody should care. What do you want Pete to do? Be home in his in his you know bedroom in tears because the team lost a game or two to start the season? Now come on, they're not in the middle of the World Series. I mean that that part of it. You want to be annoyed about how they've pitched or how they've hit, or how they've executed, or the way Milwaukee stole bases, or whatever, or the way they handle, you know, throwing at a batter, fine, you have every right. But to get on this thing with Alonzo is just, a it's dumber than dumb. It's so far past done, don't, don't dignify it with, as an argument. It's so silly, it's ridiculous. 
I don't care if he's singing there all night. Who cares? That has nothing to do with anything. But what has something to do with any something is the Mets could not afford, not emotionally, not physically, not in any way could they afford a rotten start. Because nobody believes in them to begin with. They were trying to sell you, hey, we might not look good on paper, but we have something that's a little better than you think here. Our mix is a little better than you think. And then they go out and they open the season with three straight losses. And I don't know what the weather's going to be the next couple of days as they welcome in a 3-0 and Tiger team. Now, again, don't go crazy on the Tigers because, you know, they were able to beat up on a really, really bad White Sox team. Okay? Who you play matters. It really does. I mean, you can be playing one of these teams like the A's or the White Sox. They're just really bad teams. So I wouldn't worry about that. And I don't know how many of these games they're going to get in because, like I said, the weather forecast the next couple of days is – Dreadful. Now, tomorrow is going to be 53, which is like the high till next Saturday. And there's a 60% chance of rain. Tuesday looks like a complete rain out, and the high is 45. Wednesday looks like a complete rain out, and the high is 43. And Thursday is a 75% chance of rain, and the high is 44. Nobody wants to be playing baseball in any of that. But more than that, the Mets have a new manager to sell you. They have a rotation that is basically held together here in April by thread. And they're already already 0-3. Does that mean the season's over? Of course not. But when you don't open with a victory and you have a new manager and you have a lot of question marks, the worst thing that can happen is this thing lingering. 0-3 is already too long. 0-5 or 0-6 is utter disaster for a team like this because these kinds of starts can just carry on where it takes you two months to dig out. They're capable of going into a hole. And remember, they needed a fast start the first nine games because in the middle of the month, they're going to have four games in Atlanta, three games in Los Angeles, and three games in San Francisco. That's, for them, ten games that are going to be really tough. On the road, First of all, the West Coast, you know how tough that is. Now they get the Dodgers on the road. Four in Atlanta. I mean, so they opened up with nine games that they could, they could do, you know, they could play okay. And instead, they got swept. Now here comes Detroit. And then you're hoping they can do something before things get really, really crazy. So... It could get ugly. It could get ugly fast. And while the Yankees are already giddy, and again, if you're a Mets fan, you're going to have to put up with the Yankee fans for a couple of days. Hey, it's okay. The Yankee fans right now, you know, uh, uh, walking around, and it, it, it's like New Year's Eve. But it's only four games. But the hard part is to open the season, and you can't get a W. And now... They just want a W in the worst way. They just want to get a W and get that off their back. So it could not be worse than it is right now in every way. The way the lineup's going, I know you haven't, you know, you haven't been in love with the lineup. Well, there's nothing to be in love with right now. 
I mean, they did hit some home runs on Saturday, but they looked inept in the other couple of games. All right, you know, hey, early in the season, some guys don't start fast. It's just the way things are, okay? I mean, you got to live with that. Some guys, they just don't start fast. Lindor's hitting 083, so right now he'll be the whipping boy for this week. All right, Nimmo's hitting 077, so he can be the other whipping boy for this week. McNeil's hitting 091, so throw him in, and now you got the three Stooges, okay? Hey, that will change. But the problem is not this manager, not this owner, not this entire fan base can they stand a disastrous start, and you're already one-third of the way to a nightmarish start. 0-5, oh, 1-7, and 1-8 one and one and is a – it'll take them a month and a half to climb out of that. They've got to turn this around right now because, like I said, in the middle of the month, four in Atlanta, three in L.A., three in San Francisco, they're going to have a real hard time there. The losses are going to multiply there fast. So the Mets, <laughs> think about it. While the Yankees are out in Arizona having the time of their lives, they didn't even need a plane to get there, the Mets are home looking at dismal weather for the next three nights, and they're already 0-3, and people are going nuts about them. And they're worried about Alonzo singing with Zach Bryan. I mean, give me a break. That's dumb. Worry about the team. Worry about the way some of these guys hit this weekend, okay? Worry about, you know, what Contreras did or what Yelich did or what the kid Churio, who, you know, got an 8 for $82 million contract and just played his first three games in the majors and hit 417 and, you know, basically, you know, robbed you on the base pass, all right? The Brewers had like eight steals in the weekend. Worry about those guys. And all, those, and all those batting averages, you, fat, you fattened up, you know? Adamus left here hitting 333. Terang left here hitting 455. I mean, go down the line. They looked real good, the Braves. The, the Braves, they got a little bit of a thing against the Mets. Oh, I didn't mention Hoskins, did I? Well, at least he didn't get a hit today. So he didn't rub salt in the wound. Right now, 0-3. It needs, it needs that drought, that, that Ziggy, that zero needs to come off that board real quick. We'll see you later. Thanks for listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network.